Hello, welcome to the online service of Shore Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you worshiping with us. Would you please join me in a word of prayer for our time in the scriptures? Heavenly Father, as we open up a new study, um, as we dive into Ezra and Nehemiah, we ask, Lord, that you would meet us here. Um, this is a text that is uh, ancient history, uh, theological history, and uh, it's not something we're used to reading, but uh, we ask, Lord, that you would meet us in this text and that you would teach us about you and about ourselves and relationship to you. And, and, and Lord, just illuminate it for us so that we might draw closer to you in relationship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we begin this new series on Ezra and Nehemiah, we, we need to ask ourselves the question, why do we study history? Because Ezra and Nehemiah is a history. Uh, and the typical answer to why do we study history is so that we don't repeat it, right? Well, that makes sense for the parts of history that are bad, but sometimes we do want to repeat certain things. We want to both learn from our failures and our successes. And Ezra and Nehemiah are full of both. But we as Christians want to study history for an additional reason, and that is to better understand our God. You see, Ezra and Nehemiah is not just historical, it is theologically historical. And furthermore, we learn in Luke 24, 27, that all scriptures point to Jesus. You see, Jesus appears to a couple of his disciples after his resurrection, and he begins teaching them from the Old Testament, which is the only scripture they had at the time. And, and, and that, that verse says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the things, all the scripture, excuse me, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. All right, so basically, as Sally Lloyd Jones says in her Jesus Storybook Bible, all scripture whispers his name. That is until the New Testament, of course, and when it shouts his name. But what we want to learn here from looking at Ezra and Nehemiah is we want to learn about our God. Specifically, we want to learn about Jesus and how this points forward to him. And we want to learn about ourselves in relationship to Jesus. But as I mentioned last week, who we are uh, by ourselves as individuals apart from God is minuscule and fleeting. We only really learn about ourselves and our purpose and our desires when we are learning about God. Which is why theology was once called the queen of the sciences. And one of the main things that we learn from looking at a theological history like Ezra and Nehemiah is that our God is a God who keeps his promises. When God says something will happen, it happens. Now, have you ever been streaming a live event and lag starts to develop in your feed? Maybe the audio and the visual don't match up. Well, I, I was watching a sporting event and, and I realized that a lag was developing in my internet feed. And the announcer would say in the sporting event, he shoots, he scores. And about three or four seconds later, I would see what he had said happen. And, and, and after trying a couple of things to fix the problem to no avail, I just kind of gave up and I watched the game as it was coming through. And over time, I began to just trust the announcer. And if he said that my team scored, I would cheer. And if he said that we got a penalty, I would boo. And then a few seconds later, I would see the thing that had caused me to cheer or had caused me to boo. And sometimes I would regret my boo because I would look at it and I'd be like, oh yeah, he deserved a penalty. <laughs> well, friends, one of the things we, we learn from reading theological history is that we are functioning in this life with a lag. God has spoken, but it is often a long time before we see his promises come to fruition. We, we have to hear his words and just trust that the fulfillment is coming. But that's hard to do unless we've immersed ourselves in theological history. See, just like my experience hearing the announcer saying something and then seeing it come to pass, just like that built a trust in me for what the announcer said, when we look at how God has fulfilled his promises in history, it builds a trust in us. Which is why today, as we begin our time in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, 
I'm going to preach from the book of Jeremiah. Now, why would I start a series on Ezra and Nehemiah with a sermon on Jeremiah? Because to grow in trust, we need to hear the promise and then see the fulfillment. And the very first verse of Ezra says this, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. And we'll get into what that proclamation is in the future. But if we're going to talk about the words of Jeremiah being fulfilled, we need to first know what the words of Jeremiah were. And some of your Bibles might have cross-references to Jeremiah 25, where we see Jeremiah predict the conquering of God's people, Judah, by Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian empire. And then he predicts a 70-year period of exile, followed by the punishment of Babylon. Or maybe your cross-references take you to Jeremiah 29, where God promises to return his people to their land and restore his relationship with them. Really, we see these kind of promises all over Jeremiah's prophecy. But I've actually chosen a different passage, which does hint at the exile when it says that God has watched Judah be plucked up and broken down, overthrown and destroyed. And it also hints at the return from exile when it says that God will watch over Judah to build and to plant them. But I chose this passage from Jeremiah 31 because I think it captures for us not only the promise of exile and return, but it gives us a deeper hope, a hope that we will only see fulfilled in Christ. So turn with me to Jeremiah 31, 27 through 34. God has something to say to you today. Hear it and apply it. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with a seed of man and the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow and destroy and bring harm, So I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Now, even though I've chosen this passage from Jeremiah to be our guiding verses for the day, I'm not going to break down this passage verse by verse like I normally do. I'm going to paint with kind of broad brushes, a broad brush so that we can we can gain a context for Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, already you may have noticed that I'm calling it Ezra and Nehemiah and not Ezra and Nehemiah. And that's that's because originally what we see as two books in our Bibles were once one scroll. They were written as one work. Uh, And and there are probably at least three authors who contribute to this work, uh, you know, with one scribe who compiles those different documents into one cohesive theological history. Now, of course, there are debates about those kind of things, but we are going to function under the premise that Ezra is that scribe who took the accounts of Zerubbabel, Yeshua, Nehemiah, and of course his own account, and he compiled them into a unified product. And so I want to look at the context of Ezra and Nehemiah in history and in the Bible. And then I want to look at the structure of the whole work, because that is what is going to guide us in our interpretation through this series. And finally, I want to talk about why any of this has anything to do with us. I want to talk about its significance for us.
Now let's start by talking about context. And even here, we're going to have to break context down into a couple things, historical and biblical. And first of all, let's, let's talk about historical, the historical context for Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, for those who might not know or remember the history of the Bible, I, I want to give a brief plain, you know, a, a, a briefly paint a picture, right, of the, the main events of the Old Testament, all right? And that, that's a lot to cover, all right? But I think it set, helps us set Ezra and Nehemiah in the whole history, in the big picture of history, all right? Are you ready to drink from a fire hose? Because we're going to go fast, all right? Now, of course, when we talk about the history of the Bible, we start off with creation and Adam and Eve. They're in this beautiful garden with everything they could ever want or need, but they fall into sin and they are banished from that garden. But they're also promised that one day, one of Eve's offspring would reverse what happened in the fall. All right? And, and it's not long until mankind descends into complete evil and God rescues a faithful remnant from that depravity of the world. He chooses Noah and, and Noah's family to save them from, uh, from the, the righteous judgment of, that God sends in the form of a flood. And, and he makes a covenant with Noah, promising never to wipe out the world with the flood again. A little further down the line, God calls out to Abraham, or Abram is his name before God changes it, and he tells him to leave his home and to go to a land that God has promised him. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. You might even call it Edenic, all right? Now, God makes a covenant with Abraham as well, and he promises to bless not only Abraham, but to bless the whole world through his many offspring that the Lord will provide. And Abraham is considered the father of the Hebrew nation or the Jewish nation, which is also called Israel, uh, after the name that God gave Abraham's grandson, Jacob, because remember, God changes Jacob's name to Israel. And it's also sometimes called Judah, after the name of one of Jacob's sons. Now, another one of Jacob's sons named Joseph, he gets sold into slavery by his brothers. And, and, and through God's sovereign plan, he ends up in second in command in Egypt. Now, God gives him dreams that make him aware of a coming famine so that he is able to prepare for that famine. And when that famine comes over the whole uh, ancient Near East, uh, Joseph's family, uh, who had sold him into slavery, his dad didn't know, but his brothers did, uh, they're forced to come down to Egypt to get food. Now, the family ends up staying there in Egypt, not in the promised land that God had given to them. Um, and, and his family, sometime in the next 350 years, they, it grows, and they become the Hebrew people, and they become slaves in Egypt. They grow into to millions. Now, it's at this point that God calls another man named Moses to be God's spokesman and demand the freedom of God's people. Now, a bunch of plagues and a Passover later, Moses leads the people into the wilderness where God makes a covenant with them. And he promises that he will be their God and they will be his people. And he tells them to obey his law and they will get blessed or disobey his law and they will be cursed. And so they wander in the wilderness for a while. And when they finally get back to the promised land, it's been inhabited by other people. They have to trust God and they have to go in and they have to conquer that land where they uh, and, and this is where they become a real nation. Right? And at first, they're a nation who are ruled by judges, but eventually they become a nation ruled by kings. Now, the first king, King Saul, he stinks, all right? And, and he's nothing like the king that God is for his people. So he's replaced by David, who is a man after God's own heart. And, and, and God makes a covenant with David, promising that one would come from his line who would sit on the throne forever. Well, not long after David, uh, the, the Hebrew nation splits into two kingdoms. It's a divided kingdom. There's the northern kingdom of Israel, and then there's the southern kingdom of Judah. And there are lots of wicked kings during this period who lead the nation away from God, and, and only a few kings who try to bring them back. 
And, and there's prophets too during this time. They come and, and they speak God's words and they warn the people to repent and, and obey the covenant and, and, and they're ignored. And eventually the northern kingdom is conquered by the Assyrians as punishment for breaking the covenant. But the southern kingdom holds on for another 136 years. And it's during the last 60 years of this time that the prophet Jeremiah comes and warns Judah to repent and turn to God, lest they be sent into exile, just like the northern kingdom had. But they don't listen, so God makes good on his threat, or on his promise. And they're conquered by the nation of Babylon, by the empire of Babylon. And they're taken into exile where they are for approximately 70 years, depending on when you think the end of the exile is counted. Now it's at this point, when the Persians under Cyrus the Great, defeat Babylon. And it's at this point where our scroll of Ezra and Nehemiah takes place. All right? The events in Ezra and Nehemiah span almost 110 years, 538 to 430 BC. And, and the reigns of, it spans the reigns of five Persian emperors. Now, one of those emperors doesn't make a very large appearance in this particular history, but you can learn a lot more about him from the book of Esther, which happens in the 60-year gap, which takes place between Ezra 6 and Ezra 7, all right? And we'll talk more uh, about those events in more detail when we look at the structure of the book. Now, after our book of Ezra and Nehemiah, there are about 400 years of silence from God, which we call the intertestamental period. Now, during that time, Alexander the Great takes over the world, and then he dies young, splitting his empire between four generals. The Jewish people rebel against their overlord and rule themselves for about 100 years. And this is known as the Hasmonean dynasty, or the Maccabean period. And a miracle during this time is why the Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah even today. Now, Pompey and the Romans conquered Jerusalem in 63 B.C., and then Jesus is born between 6 and 4 BC, all right, about 60 years later. Now, if you want a history of Christianity from that point forward, I'm going to have to do a separate class. But for now, you know, stand up, pause the video, take a stretch. You know, if you're watching with someone else, maybe give them a shake or something if you need to, because I just covered thousands of years of history in maybe just over 800 words, okay? So that's the historical context for where Ezra and Nehemiah fits in the picture of the Bible, okay? Uh, and the picture of the history of the Bible, that is. Now, let's look at it in biblical context. And, and actually, if you're an outliner, you kind of need two more headings under this biblical context, right? You need the, the biblical context in terms of the canon of the Bible, and, and, and then you also need it in terms of the message or revelation or story of the Bible, all right, so if you've turned, so let's look at the canon first. If, you, if you've turned to Ezra and Nehemiah in your Bible, you'll notice that they come pretty early in the Old Testament, before the Psalms and the Proverbs and the Prophets, when actually the events of these two books that you have in your Bible, really one book, they're the very last things recorded in the Old Testament. If we were doing it chronologically, they'd be at the very end. Uh, but... The reason that they are where they are is because the Old Testament was kind of put together and grouped by genre, all right, more than chronology, which means that um, it, it makes sense that Ezra and Nehemiah would be grouped with other theological histories like Kings and Chronicles. In fact, an interesting thing to note is that if you look at the first three verses of Ezra, they exactly match the last two verses of Second Chronicles. And that shows that there is a continuity of uh, theological history happening here. And that's something that a scribe like Ezra would do very intentionally. But more important than its physical place in the biblical canon is its place in the message or the revelation or the story of the Bible. And this is why I've chosen Jeremiah 31 to be our guiding passage today. Because in it, we not only see that God is faithful to fulfill his promises, but we also see that there is a bigger picture to look at. There's a bigger story at play, which this exile and return are merely a small part. 
And, and the fact that, that this is just a small part of a bigger story, it points to the fact that there is a bigger story. Uh, and, and, and you may have heard some re recurring themes as I recounted the history of the Old Testament. For one, this isn't the first time God's people have been exiled. Adam and Eve were exiled out of Eden, right? Joseph was exiled, right, to, to Egypt. The nation of Israel was forced to wander in the desert before they could reclaim the promised land. You see, this theme of exile and redemption permeates the story of the Bible. And so you will see many references in this series on Ezra and Nehemiah to things like the Exodus from Egypt. We'll see parallels that key, on, key in on this idea of God's people being a righteous remnant. Those who are not only part of Israel by name, but actually devoted in faith to him. Now, another large part of the story is this hope for a messianic king and a new covenant. Now, you heard me highlight some of the covenants that God made with his people in the Old Testament history. Well, this idea of covenant promises is huge in Ezra and Nehemiah. And in fact, the first verse, which we already read, should immediately remind us of the promises that God makes in Jeremiah for a new covenant. All right, it's, it's kind of like a hyperlink on a web page. As soon as you read that word, it's kind of like clicking on it and it jumping back in, in the history of the Bible to remind us what Jeremiah's prophecy actually was. So let's, let's look at Jeremiah's prophecy one more time, starting in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So you can already see this hyperlink takes us back to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah has a hyperlink that takes us back to Moses and, 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 and the Exodus, all right? So in Jeremiah, we see this new covenant promised, okay? And we see that this new covenant will be different from the covenant that was made with Moses. Now, it won't, not because, it won't be different because the new covenant won't have the covenant curses like the covenant with Moses did, but because those curses for disobeying the covenant won't be imposed on the people. You see, in Moses' covenant, which you can see probably most clearly and, and concisely summarized in Deuteronomy, God promised blessings for, the, for his people if they should keep his covenant, meaning those who obey his law. But he promises curses for those who break his covenant. And that is how we find ourselves where we are here in Ezra and Nehemiah. That is how the nation of Israel and Judah found themselves in exile because they broke the covenant with God by worshiping foreign idols. And, and God, I got to tell you, was extremely patient with his people. All right. The people of God had been worshiping idols since the moment they actually received the law and the covenant with God. Remember the golden calf that they made while Moses was still on the mountain talking to God? And then they broke the covenant during the period of the judges, right? And you see this cycle of, uh, of falling into idolatry and then someone coming along and spurring repentance and then them uh, returning to God, but then falling into idolatry again in this horrible downward spiral. And then we also see it in the kings, as the kings are led astray and, and follow after foreign gods and idols. And I mean, we're talking about an 800-year period of these shenanigans before God finally makes good on his word and sends his people into exile as punishment for their disobedience of the covenant. But in this new covenant that Jeremiah promises, we will find that the people don't do much better when it comes to obeying God's law and keeping his covenant. So instead, God doesn't impose the covenant curses on them. But spoilers, he takes the curses upon himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, we're only in a covenant with God because Jesus took the curses that we deserved upon himself himself. 
in our place. All right, so that's how we are in a covenant with God. So let's continue here looking at Jeremiah verse 33. All right, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Do you see how God is promising that the law will no longer be this external thing that the people keep failing to obey? but instead it will be an internal one. And and throughout Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that even though there is renewed worship as the people of God come back into their land, rebuild their temple, and and so on, and and there is a rereading of the law, uh, that law doesn't seem to be written on the people's hearts yet. Okay, And this, this will only come about when the Holy Spirit is given in Pentecost. We have God's law written on our Heart because the Holy Spirit has changed our heart. But even then, even now, we won't see the law so ingrained in our hearts that we don't need Bible teachers, right? Now, if this promise from Jeremiah were already fulfilled, I wouldn't be sitting here today preaching this sermon to you. You wouldn't need me to preach to you because it would already be written on your heart. And because it is not yet fulfilled, that means that it is still future For us, which means we are part of this story. As we watch the successes and failures of the people in Ezra and Nehemiah, we can relate to them because even though they are returning from exile and renewing worship, they're not yet receiving the fullness of God's promises. They they must continue in faith despite disappointment, just as we must do trusting that because God said it would happen, one day it will. Now this brings us to the structure of Ezra and Nehemiah. All right? We get an idea of what this scroll is all about when we look at the way that Ezra structured all these accounts of these multiple returns to Jerusalem and these multiple building projects. Now the first thing to note is that there are three main sections in this scroll. Each one focuses on a specific leader or maybe a group of leaders and on a specific project of renewal. Now, the first section is in Ezra 1 through 6. And here we have Zerubbabel and Yeshua. And they are part of this original group of of exiles who return to Jerusalem. Now, Zerubbabel's name means planted in Babylon. And he is quite literally and figuratively representing the exiles who are coming out of Babylon and returning to their home and reestablishing the worship of Yahweh. Now, Yeshua, one of his compatriots, who shares a name with Jesus, his name means Yahweh saves his people. And and we kind of see a redemption happening as they return out of exile and to the promised land. Now, Cyrus, the king of Persia, makes a decree to send these exiles back to their home countries and to help them reestablish their worship. Now, that might seem like a strange thing, but it was the political practice of the Persians across the board. Uh, They returned captives to their countries all over the world. So Zerubbabel and Jeshua set out to rebuild the altar and the temple that had been destroyed when Babylon conquered them. And in the process they meet some opposition. And this opposition is overcome by the providence of God. And during this account, there are reasons for celebrating, right? There there is a renewal of the altar and the temple and of worship. There are reasons to celebrate, but there are also disappointments, right? The uh, elders who had been alive long enough to see the old temple before it was destroyed, see this new temple and are disappointed in it and they weep. That's just one example. Now, you'll notice that this pattern repeats in all three of our sections. In section two, which takes place 60 years later in Ezra 7 through 10, we meet Ezra himself. 
And we see him try to bring renewal of the Torah. And the Torah is the law of God, the first five books of the Old Testament. And, and, and so uh, he tries to read this law to the people and reestablish the covenant community of God's people. He too is sent by a Persian king to do this. And he too faces opposition and overcomes that opposition. But he too, while he does have some reason to celebrate, he also has reasons to be disappointed. Finally, we have Nehemiah in the third section. This takes place in Nehemiah 1 through 7. He is also sent by a king of Persia to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he too faces opposition and overcomes that opposition. And he too has reasons to celebrate and reasons to be disappointed. Then we have the two final sections of the scroll, which I believe underscore the pattern which we've already seen. The first section, or I guess technically is the fourth section. The fourth section is Nehemiah 8 through 12. And, and we see this in this huge section, a spiritual renewal, which is something to be celebrated. But then we end with Nehemiah 13, the last section. And we have a very disappointing ending to the book. Where Nehemiah looks upon the people who have been keeping covenant with God. And they have... They have um, they, uh, I said that wrong, who have not been keeping covenant with God. Uh, that's why it's disappointing. And, and he looks at them and he sees how they have undone the work of all three of the first three sections. They've undone the work of Zerubbabel by neglecting and misusing the temple. They've undone the work of Ezra by violating the Torah and working on the Sabbath. Uh, and, and, they've, they even, uh, and even the work of Nehemiah himself is, is tainted by the people setting up businesses around the walls of the city and working and doing trade on the Sabbath. And that's where our scroll ends. What a downer, right? But this brings us to our final point. What is the significance? I think in the structure of the book, we see a significance of Ezra and Nehemiah that applies to us, all right? So what is that significance for us? Well, I'll tell you now that I think there are a ton of lessons for us when it comes to how we interact with God and, and, and the world around us in this scroll. But I don't want to spoil the next few months of sermons right now. Instead, I want to point us back to the big picture, which I already hinted at. Just like the Israelites who are returning from captivity have much to celebrate, we have been released from our captivity, our slavery to sin by faith in Jesus Christ. And this is reason to celebrate. But likewise, just as the Israelites had disappointments, we too will face disappointments in this life. We will occasionally fall back into sin. We will find ourselves serving idols in our lives. Idols like success and pleasure and power and comfort. We might not serve carved statues of foreign gods, but we will find idolatry in our hearts. We will also have opposition to overcome enemies, natural disasters, sickness, death. But by God's sovereign plan, we know that eventually we will overcome that opposition. Now, as we stare at the disappointment in our lives that appears over and over and over again, we must hang on to the fact that the promises of God are not yet complete. We see in Ezra and Nehemiah that God was faithful to fulfill his promise to bring his people back into their land. The repetition of this learning about God's faithfulness should cause us to really trust that God has more for us. The Israelites rebuilt the temple, reestablished worship, renewed covenant faithfulness to the law, and rebuilt their blessed city. And yet, God did not descend upon their temple. Their hearts were not yet turned from stone to flesh. The city was not yet a heavenly utopia. The messianic king did not yet return. They had to wait 400 years for Jesus to come. What a disappointment, right? And when, when we have uh, who knows how many years before Jesus returns in his second coming. But we can know that his coming is guaranteed. We can know that because of what he did while he was here in his first coming. We are guaranteed to be changed. Now we will be given eventually 
new, sinless bodies, spiritual bodies. We will dwell in, in the presence of our Lord for eternity where sin will have no hold over us, where sickness and death will play no role. Now, as Christians, we tend to, and it's, not, it's right that we do this, but we tend to focus on the justification that we have in Christ through his death and resurrection. And that is a major part of the gospel, right? That is what leads us to our uh, to understanding how we are our punishment is is remitted, and how um, his substitutionary atonement uh, makes us right with God and, and restores us into relationship with God, and that is all good. But we often forget to look forward to our coming glorification, which we will have at His return. The second coming, you see, is a crucial part of the gospel that we often neglect. Friends, there is a coming restoration that will make all things right. All the promises of God will be fulfilled and we will dwell in peace and joy for all time. The word of God, his law will be written on our hearts. Our hearts will no longer be stone and sinful. They will be soft, fleshy hearts, which love God perfectly because we are without sin, because he has removed it from us. Let that drive you through your days. Now, my last pastor, uh, who I sat under, would often record the Washington football games and, and watch them later because he often had other responsibilities on Sundays. And he was very touchy about people ruining the outcome of the game for him. And, and he would often turn his phone off completely so that no one could text him about the game. And I guess he figured that, you know, not knowing the outcome of the game made watching the game more exciting. And maybe that's true for the spectator. But put yourself in the shoes of a player. Don't you think that if you knew that you were guaranteed to win the game, that would free you up to play with joy and a, and a real passion and a love for the game? Don't you think that you would play even harder knowing that your play, the play that you make, might be the one that guarantees victory? Friends, we know the outcome of the largest story ever told, the story of human history. We know the outcome because God has promised us victory. Now, we don't know how we'll get there, and we don't know what role we will play, but victory is assured. So trust in God's word. Trust in his promises. Believe in the gospel, not only that you are saved by the grace of Christ, but also that you have a future glory awaiting you. Live a life that reflects your belief in this truth. Live like you mean it. Amen? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we covered a ton of ground today as we begin our series in Ezra and Nehemiah. And I just ask that, that this big picture would remain in our minds. I ask, Lord, that as we start to pick apart Ezra and Nehemiah and break it down into smaller chunks and, and, and see what's in there, that we would not lose sight of the big picture of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. God, here we have a microcosm of restoration. But we look forward, even us, in 2023, we look forward to a future restoration when you will make all things new. Lord, help us to keep our hearts and minds focused on that, that we might live now in light of the truth, in light of the fact that we are victors because we are in Christ. We pray all of this in his majestic, awesome, and holy name. Amen.